Yo, what's going on, everybody? Derek here. Appreciate anybody who's tuning in live or after the fact. Appreciate all you guys. Oh, I'm tripping. One second. I got my Bluetooth all hooked up and stuff. Make sure that I'm coming out the speakers the way that I want to be. Internal. Yep. What's going on? If you're new, I appreciate it if you drop the like, comment, questions, comments, or concerns that you have as I'm going through it here. Uh, any recommendations, suggestions? Hello, Derek. Always looking for more insight into the market. Of course, Franklin. Of course. That's what I'm hoping to do here today uh, by connecting with some homeowners in my virtual market and uh, hoping to qualify some, some folks here today. I uh, had a really good conversation yesterday. I'm still wrapping my head around my new dialer. Uh, I've upgraded from Mojo, which is a triple line dialer. It will call three people at a time. Uh, I've upgraded. Well, I'm saying it's an upgrade. I've changed my dialer to call tools and call tools can call up to 10 people at a time, although it's not recommended. Uh, the pros in the industry recommend not going over five lines uh, because at that rate, you're kind of just burning through your data and the other lines will answer and you won't be on the phone to talk with them. So that's something that I have noticed uh, differing from Mojo. With Mojo, it gave you the ability to play a callback message. So it would dial three numbers at the same time, three different people. And let's say person one answered the phone. And while you're talking to person one, person three answers the phone because it was still ringing. What you had the ability to do on Mojo was drop a, they called it a callback message to line three while you're on the phone with line one. And what that would sound like to line three when they pick up and they say, hello, uh, I've pre-recorded a message that says, hello, hello, can you hear me? Hello, sorry, let me call you right back. And that's pre-recorded. And it plays to them. So at least they think that I was there, but just had some type of connection issue. Then when I am done with line one, Mojo would have automatically called back line three and it would tell you calling back. So you knew that they got your callback message and now you're calling them back. And then you can just start that conversation with, hey, sorry about that. Had some connection issues. Is this blah, blah, blah. And just go right into the script. Um, it doesn't seem like that is the case with call tools. There is no ability to believe a callback message. It just simply drops the call, uh, or rather it, it, it'll, if they're willing to hold with nobody there, uh, then they, they will, or they could. But, um, what I found is that people, yeah, I mean, it only takes two seconds for somebody to get on the line and be like, hello, hello, hang up, you know? So my abandon rate, and that's why people don't recommend going over five on call tools, five lines, because then you just run the risk of having a bunch of people answer and you not even being on the line to actually talk with them. So I've been sticking to three. Uh, I had a really good session yesterday. I got like 22 contacts in, in like really like 45 minutes, which is the most I've ever had. Um, I attribute it to the dialer. It's a predictive dialer. Hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a predictive dialer, um, which means that it has voicemail or yeah, voicemail machine detection. So it is uh, doing a lot better job of detecting whether it's a machine or an actual human that's answered the phone. And it only patches to, or rather it tries its very best to only patch through uh, actual humans as opposed to patching through a bunch of voicemails. And that is something that I found different uh, with Mojo. It was like almost the whole time you were just like marking it as a, a machine. You would, you would mark it as no contact, like no contact. This isn't a human, no contact, no contact. But with my dialing session yesterday, I only had to do that for like two or three, two or three times it actually connected and it was a voicemail. Um, and it, it even gives you the ability to connect slow, normal, or fast if you want to connect fast, then it's going to leave less time for the, the software to detect if it's a voicemail. So if you want to connect fast, you run the risk of connecting with a lot of machines. If you want to run slow, then you run the risk of not connecting quick enough to the humans when they answer and they say hello. Uh, so I have it at normal and 
I almost want to even just drop it down to slow because my abandon rate yesterday was like 40%. So although I connected with 22 people in like 45 minutes, um, four tenths of the people that I was, I could have connected with, uh, answered a human answered and then hung up before I got to the line to actually say something to them. And I find that, uh, it'll connect me. And whereas with Mojo, I used to wait because it would connect me right away with Mojo. And I would be able to hear it in the industry. They refer to it as the first hello, um, meaning the dialer connects to them before they even say hello when they answer the phone. Um, so I would hear the first hello on Mojo. But on this, um, it seems as if I'm connecting after they actually say hello. Uh, so they'll say hello, then I'll connect. And then by the time I connect, I, I kind of wait a second thinking that they're getting ready to say hello. And then they hang up. So what I've been trying to make a habit of is connecting and just saying, being the first person to say something. Hey, hey, Franklin. You know, and sometimes they say hello as I'm saying that, and it's really no big deal. I'd rather that than uh, miss out on an opportunity to talk with somebody, right? I'm saying, hey, Franklin, and and he's saying hello for the first time, and then it's just like, oh, oh, sorry, hey, Franklin. You know, so it's like real quick, uh, you're able to kind of overcome that little awkwardness right in the beginning of the conversation. So that's something that I'm trying to make a habit of. Um, just trying to refine my process with this specific dialer. Um, so... I'm feeling really good about this dialer. I'm also getting the SMS going text campaign. So I, I'm dedicating my Mondays and my Tuesdays to sending out new texts um, because it's on a drip campaign. It's automated. So in the beginning of the campaign, the first three days, they get three messages more than that, actually. So on Monday, I drop them that first text and a ringless voicemail. What a ringless voicemail is. Uh, I'm sure yeah, I'm talking to you, Frank, because you're in here. You've probably seen and picked up on the fact that sometimes you have voicemails on your phone, but you don't have any missed calls. Or it's like you'll get a voicemail and you'll be like, and you will have a missed call, but you'll think to yourself, my phone didn't just ring. Like how did, and what happens is that's a ringless voicemail. So what the, the system does, the software does for ringless voicemails is, It'll dial in to the number that you're, you're ready to drop a voicemail on and right away dial in again with a second line. So that second line gets patched directly to your voicemail machine. And then that first line hangs up. So your phone doesn't even actually ring. It's all happening simultaneously within milliseconds. One line dials, a second line dials, gets patched right through to your voicemail because the first line is taking up that line. The first line hangs up and now you have the ability to leave a voicemail without actually uh, calling. Yeah, it's pretty wild. And so what happens is I can automatically do that. I don't actually have to be on the phone. Uh, so what I'm doing is I pre-record a message and I'll play it to you right here. Uh, pre-record a message to use as a ringless voicemail drop. And then uh, it'll just automatically do that. So this is somebody, Joe. Hi, Joe. Have you given anything? This is on the 25th of October. This is kind of the progression of that automation. Uh, it's all hands off. All I literally did was I, it took me, I'm not going to lie. It took me a really long time to set all of the campaigns up, but now it's just all automatic. I just need to add them to the campaign and then it just starts going through the drip just so you can get through as many calls as possible. Just so you just leave voicemails on everyone's. It's kind of like a different, different tactic. It's almost like a ringless voicemail isn't even like, I wouldn't even compare it to a voicemail. It's like apples to oranges. A ringless voicemail is like almost like a text to me. Uh, it's just another way to get somebody to call you back um, because it adds that human element to it. Whereas like if somebody's like a, if anybody's sophisticated enough, they can dissect the text that I'm sending out and realize that it's a mass text. Uh, it's not just going to them. Obviously that's my goal to try to tailor it and make it you know curated enough where it seems as if I'm texting them directly. Funny enough, yesterday I texted somebody and he was like, yeah, I'd listen to an offer. And then I started asking about the condition of the property. And he was like, oh, I didn't realize this was a mass text. So it was kind of bittersweet because it's like, oh, okay, well, I did my job. I, I made it seem as if I was just texting him. But now that I kind of played my hand, uh, he realized that I, I didn't know anything about the property, which happens. But uh, but your main goal is still to get the person on the phone, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's something that a lot of people 
do when they turn to texting, which is something that I'm trying to make, um, and, you know, I'm trying to be very intentional about it. People have creative avoidance about getting on the phone and they turn to texting as an alternative, thinking that they can handle the whole process via text. Not to say that you can't because some people just prefer texting, which is why I implemented texting in the first place, because some people don't like answering their phone if they don't know the number. But that doesn't mean they're not interested in selling the property. Some people's just preferred method of communication is text. Sometimes it's email. I've heard of people in my my coaching group close deals strictly through email, not even talking to anybody on the phone. So it can happen. But um, it's just uh, the pros. What they'll do is they'll start with the lowest cost marketing, which is texting. It cost, I, I can send out um, a hundred. I can send out a hundred texts for seventy five cents, dirt cheap. Um, so what, what 10,000, 10,000 for 10,000 for 75 bucks. Um, so that's just like getting my, my numbers pumped up. Like I, it allows me to reach way more people than I would on a dialer. Like yesterday on my 45 minute dialing session, dialing three lines in time, I got through like 600 properties, um, which is a lot, a lot compared to what I used to get through. I used to get through like a hundred an hour. Um, and that's that voicemail detection just not wasting my time patching me through to machines. Uh, I guess it might be better to just send out as many voicemails as possible and bank on some people calling back. I feel like texting isn't as good of an initial starting point. So I'll, I'll, exactly. So I'll, I'll explain, I'll read you through my automation right now, but can always move over to text. So boom. So this guy on the 25th of October says, hi, Joe, have you given any thoughts of parting ways with his address? It's a like a custom field so that it, it automatically imports the address into the text. So I don't have to you know manually put it in. Um, can we talk about it? If he doesn't answer in three minutes, he gets this ringless voicemail. Hey, I just texted you about a property I believe you own. Uh, my partner and myself, we're local home buyers, uh, we got some cash on hand and we're looking to pick up one, uh, maybe two more properties in that area there. I just wanted to give you a shot to see if you'd ever consider selling. Boom. That's a ringless voicemail that gets dropped again three minutes after the text if they don't respond then if they don't respond to that day two hey joe i reached out yesterday about address are you free to talk today if he doesn't respond to that text one hour later he gets this ringless voicemail hey how's it going i hadn't heard back so just wanted to round back uh, double check to see if you were interested in receiving a cash offer on your property there uh if not completely understand uh just let me know one way or another so i can stop bugging you here Boom. So I give them an out, right? Uh, and it's all pretty much automated. Yeah, it's all automated. This is all happening. All I have to do, I I set the campaign up like that. So where it's like, first they get this text. Then three minutes later, if they don't um, reply, they get this ringless voicemail. 25 hours later, if they haven't replied to that, they get another text. You know, an hour after that, if they haven't replied, they get this ringless voicemail. So I pre-recorded my voicemails. I pre-typed out my scripts for my text. So it's literally happening on, on all on automatic. I'll show you because um, they have an app pretty cool. I really started to see the power of this um, the other day. Oh, I've already clicked into the notification, but I was just out driving and I just randomly started getting texts and it was like, no, not interested, not selling, not selling. And some, I got one lead. It was like, yeah, I'd listen to an offer. And I got another one actually was like, uh, he's on my Instagram story. That's like the best conversation that I've had. Um, but to finish the script, essentially, then, you know, on the third day, they, uh, he gets a text. Hey there, just following up on the text I sent. Did you have a number in mind that you'd be hoping to get for address? Uh, just in case. I, and then one minute later, if they haven't replied, they get another text. Just in case I didn't mention this, any condition is okay with us. We can pay all the closing costs and you wouldn't have to pay any fees. And this person specifically, at, only at that point did they reply saying, we don't own that property. Please remove me and my number from your list. Probably because they realized I wasn't going to let up until they told me either they don't own the property, they're not interested, or they are interested. Or if I have the wrong number or something like that, right? So then boom, I realized that this is the wrong number. Now, when I get the information for homeowners, I'm getting up to 10 phone numbers. I only use the top three, which is recommended because they're in order of uh, like relevance, essentially, like the last known used phone number for this person. So like 90% of the time it's phone number one, um, but you'd be surprised how many times it is phone number three where you actually connect with that person that you're looking for. Um, so in this case, uh, they told me that 
I had the wrong number. So I, um, I added a tag to this property, which will then automatically, the tag name is replaced number two. I named it that. And then I add the tag and all automatically, I have a bunch of triggers set up in the background as well, which is essentially like a bunch of if then statements. Like if I add the tag replace number two, then switch the phone number out with the second one in line, remove the tag replied because it was going to get automatically tag replied once that person said replied and then uh, start them in the beginning of the campaign again. So that's what happened with this person. I, I added the tag replace number two. I um, sent out the text and now it's all over again. It's just kind of running through it and I can uh, um, kind of see when at one point people are actually replying at what point, uh, you know, the only thing that I can't see, which is something that I wish I could is what message. So I can see the reply rate of the campaign wide thing of the campaign wide. I can see the reply rate. So I'm at about 25% reply rate. So, uh, meaning that if I send out a hundred texts through that first initial campaign, then uh, about a quarter of them, 25 people are responding, right? You know, I imagine a majority of those, probably 24 of them are telling me that it's either wrong number, they're not interested, uh, stuff of that nature. But I have about a 25% reply rate on that first. Um, but you can see, I wanted to pull up my kind of hottest one that I've gotten through texting. And I've only been doing this for about a week. And again, I just go back to my initial point. That's why I've dedicated Mondays and Tuesdays to sending out that first text, because the people who get that first text on Monday, if they don't reply, they're going to get text and voicemailed on Monday, text voicemail drop Tuesday, double texted on Wednesday. Uh, and then the people on Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, and then as I add them into different campaigns, like uh, then I have a, a cold campaign where they're not interested. I don't think I'm going to utilize that campaign because I don't really have the budget to be uh, marketing to people who are who have already let me know that they're not interested. But the pros do. The pros will market to those people still um, because people's circumstances change. Right. So they'll they'll re, re add them to the campaign three months from now. Um, but again, I don't really have the budget to allow me to do that. Um, but then I have a warm campaign where it's like interested, but not right now. Then I add them to that campaign and they get an automated drip just the same. Different scripts. Hey, uh, you know, thanks for talking with me about address. Um, you know, I, I understand that you weren't ready right now. You know, whatever the script, I don't know the exact script, but I, I typed it all out at one point. Um, but I wanted to, I have five people who are at attention. So this is a woman, his name is Sharon. She's the bit, the hottest lead that I've gotten through text. And just wanted to kind of read through what like the progression of the conversation was because it's interesting to me uh, because she did not reply to that initial uh, that initial message, um, which again showcases the strength of the automation and the the follow up. So she got texted first. Hi Sharon, have you given any thoughts of parting ways with address? Can we talk about it? It actually kicked me back an error, and this was my fault because when I imported my list. I didn't section it off by uh, mobile numbers versus landline. So once I do that, the next time I import a new list, which I should do like next week, um, and I only import mobile, that's going to take a lot of the manual labor out of it. Whereas right now, I do have to be looking at every text that goes out because I get charged even if they're getting sent to a, a landline. So this one got sent to a landline. I tagged it, replaced number two. It swapped out that second phone number. It sent them the same exact message. Hi, Sharon. Have you given any thoughts of parting ways with address? Can we talk about it? I sent off that initial voicemail drop. No response. The next day, hey, Sharon, I reached out yesterday about address. Are you free to talk today? She replies saying, I'm not interested in selling as long as my daughter and family live in it. This was kind of a soft no, right? It wasn't a stop texting me. You know, it's like kind of like and this is this is my goal as well when I'm on the phone is trying to read between the lines and figure out if there's any type of consideration in their voice. Uh, and if there is, I want to dig deeper, right? So she says, I'm not interested in selling as long as my daughter and family live in it. I said, that's understandable. Just so I fully understand, is there a possibility that they are moving or have there been no, dis no discussions about it? She says, we have had discussions, but finding an affordable place is ridiculous. Now we're starting to kind of build a little rapport, right? Yeah. I say, yeah, I hear you. Uh, if you did end up selling, and I kind of just go right back to the script, if you did end up selling, 
did y'all have a number in mind that you'd be hoping to get for it? I had to drop the y'all, you know what I mean? These Texans got to, got to try to uh, meet them at their level. Did y'all have a number in mind that you'd be hoping to get for it? She said, and this is, that was, I want to make it clear. That was very bold of me um, to go straight for the, the, the ask for the price. Um, but I felt good about it because she was kind of like shooting the shit with me already talking about, yeah, the prices are ridiculous, you know? So I asked, you know, did you have a number in mind? She says, I have to see what repairs need done, but was thinking 140 if I sell it as is. It has new windows, recent roof, new AC, et cetera. I said, and I and then I quickly ran the numbers. Um, the after repair value on this property is two, in my opinion, two hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars, meaning that once an investor buys it in its as is condition and dumps probably forty to fifty thousand dollars in renovation to bring it up to 2021 standards, you know, all white kitchens, new paint, new bathrooms, new roof, new AC unit, all that, all you know, the uh, the works, then it'll be worth two hundred twenty five. So then, in order to calculate what my offer is, I have to reverse engineer it. So at two twenty five. I multiply that. This is my formula. I multiply 225 by 0.92. What that is taken into consideration is the end buyer's fees and commissions that they will have to pay on the back end. So just imagine an end buyer buys the property. They spend all that money to fix it up. Now they have to sell it on the market. When they go to sell it on the market, they're going to likely, if they don't have any realtor relationships, they're going to have to pay 3% commission for the selling the listing agent, they're going to have to pay 3% for the buyer's agent. They're going to have to pay, you know, one to 2% in closing costs. And the benefit that I offered when I go direct to seller, I offer them the fact that I will cover the closing costs, which means when I assign my interest in the contract to my cash buyer, they will have to pay the closing costs on my transaction that goes direct to sellers. So not only will they have to pay closing costs on the back end when they go to sell the fixed up property, but they have to pay the closing costs right now in order to buy it. So that's why I multiply it by 0.92. I know a lot of people, you know, who are doing this type of formula, they will do 0.94, but I've found that that's, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to start assuming because people who do 0.94, they have buyers, they have buyers who they know have realtor relationships. So they're not having to pay the full 3% for the listing agent. Uh, a lot of people who are in this game and they bring constant business to agents, agents will charge 1% just to list it. They don't, cause they don't have to do any work. They just throw it up on the MLS. They have access to the MLS. So they'll go list it for 1%. Why not? You're going to list the property for 225,000. I'll take a couple grand just to throw it up there for you and start fielding offers. And just shoot you a text you know what i mean hey do you like this offer all right boom you sold it you know what i mean it's like not much work um and nowadays people will even um agents will list for a flat fee so they'll say i'll just do it for a thousand bucks you know what i mean and, and again once you are established in the industry as an investor you start to have those and build those relationships with realtors which is why wholesalers can be confident to not take a full 8% off of the ARV, but rather a 4%. But for now, I don't necessarily think that I have those type of buyers in my back pocket. So I just want to assume that I'm going to be trying to find a buyer who has cash, but doesn't necessarily have a bunch of you know industry relationships. So back to the formula, 225 on the back end. I multiply that by 0.92, which gives me 207. Now what I have to take into consideration is buyer profit, which, uh, uh, you know, People rule of thumb is 10% of ARV. So if they think that they can sell the property for 225, they'll likely want anywhere between 20 to $25,000 in profit. Once you get over 300,000, they're going to want at least 30,000 in profit on the flip. Um, and, and people will do a minimum of 20,000. So if the ARV is like 180, as opposed to trying to take like 18%, I just, people just do 20, 20,000 minimum or 10%. For me, I like to make my minimum twenty five thousand. Um, one because that will have me coming in at a lower price. It'll give me a little bit of room to negotiate, knowing that in the back of my head I have maybe five thousand dollars, you know, to come up. Um, or on the, you know, when I do go to look for a, a buyer, and I ain't, am possibly able to find somebody who doesn't 
want 25,000, they're cool with 15,000, then that's just more money in my pocket. So from 207, I'll do minus 25 for 25,000 of buyer profit. Then I have to consider um, repair costs. So on a, I think hers was a 1700 square foot property. Um, 1700 square foot property. Uh, it sounds like she has done some repairs. She said she had put in a new roof, new AC, new windows, which is really good because those are the uh, typically the driving factors in the renovation costs. Um, those are the big ticket items, roof, AC, if there's any foundation issues. Um, yeah, and then behind that comes like the full renovation to the bathrooms and the kitchen. And then beyond that, it's just like carpet, paint, siding, um, landscaping could be a big one if it's really messed up. But uh, on this case, in 1700 square feet, I have a little cheat sheet for myself, whether or not it's going to be a light renovation, an average renovation, or a heavy renovation. Light renovation is just like carpet paint. Average is carpet paint, kitchen baths. Uh, heavy is all of the above, plus HVAC, uh, roof, windows, siding. You know, Again, this the big ticket items like I was talking about, foundation. So in this case, I would call it probably an average. So I think 40,000 in repairs from 182 puts us right at 142. Now, you know, mind you, she's asking for 140. So if I were actually buying this property for myself, I would be pretty confident to be able to buy it from her at 140 and be able to net around $25,000. Now, what I need to do, what I need to consider as a wholesaler is this is 142 is what my end buyer will be willing to pay for it to, again, make a $25,000 profit. Now, all I have to do is get it lower than that. I simply carve out my own profit from this. And if I can get, uh, you know, 142, if I can get uh, her down to 132, I've carved myself out a $10,000 uh, assignment fee, $10,000 profit for myself. If I can get it down to 122, um, you know, I carved out a $20,000 assignment fee for myself. So, and, and that is contingent on me finding a cash buyer that's willing to pay 142. But if my numbers are accurate, accurate, which I feel that they are, I, I was able to, you know, use a lot of good comparable properties in the area. Uh, I think this is a strong property right here, strong lead. So what happened with this one? In response to her saying 140, I said, okay, if I could be somewhere in that ballpark and was able to work with your family and their timeline, so they're also being treated with respect here, is that something you'd be open to moving forward on before the holiday season? She says, let me think on it. I'll need to discuss with the daughter too. I said, of course, I wouldn't want you to do it any other way. Would it be appropriate if I followed up around this time next week to check in with you? She said, okay. I said, all right, talk soon. So that one's uh, the hottest lead that I've gotten through texts by far. Um, I've only sent out about 350 texts. I've had some other people who are like, I'll listen to an offer. What's your offer? I need this much, you know. Um, but there's no real, no, no real motivation, right? She's motivated. I don't know exactly why they're wanting to sell, but clearly they've talked about it. Her daughter lives there with what seems to me uh, like her kids or something. Um, so it's just a matter of why they want to sell in the first place. Uncovering the problem is the biggest thing in what a wholesaler does. Price aside, condition of the property aside, we're solving problems. We're trying to find people who have a problem, likely financial, um, that can be solved by liquidating the asset, right? You know, a large majority of people in America, their biggest asset is uh, their home, um, you know, not to get like funny about it, but Robert Kiyosaki would disagree. He would actually call the house a liability, which is true in pretty much 100% of these type of leads cases because um, assets don't take money out of your pocket. They put money in and the, the, this property to her is likely a liability because um, and, and anybody who's uh, really considered a lead to me, their property is really a liability because it's digging them in a deeper hole. It's putting them in more financial distress. It is not putting money in their pocket. It's taking money out. And by liquidating that uh, liability, they can solve a lot of their problems. So I'm going to follow up with that one. Um, 
in a couple days. I think I talked to her on like Wednesday or something like that. So a week from Wednesday, I'm going to do that. Um, for now, did I miss any? And it's pretty much automated. Yep, it's all automated. Um, and then, yeah, so then I can, uh, depending on what the response is, I can drop them into other campaigns um, so that they're just constantly being marketed to. Something that I have to be careful of is because it's happening on autopilot and every text that goes out, every ringless voicemail that goes out, uh, it costs me money. Uh, not a lot at all, but the point is to do this at scale. So, uh, gotta be a little careful. So, uh, right now I have a general 30 day campaign, which is that initial campaign just to try to get some replies in. And then I have seven replied campaigns. One is a cold campaign, which I was talking about me probably not going to utilize. Um, that's if they're just not interested at all. Uh, I've dropped a few people in there just to kind of test it out uh, if they're not interested, but they have been like kind of nice about it. Like, oh, no, thank you. Thanks for reaching out, though. I appreciate the inquiry. I, I put a couple of those people in the cold campaign just to see what it looked like. Um, there's a, a warm lead flow campaign, <clears throat> which is interested, but not right now. Hot lead flow campaign, interested, uh, but no appointment has been made or no offer has been made rather for me because I'm virtual. Uh, and I'm not actually physically going on appointments. Um, lead offer stage, which is an offer was made, but it hasn't been accepted. Uh, lead scheduled appointment. This is something that's like pretty important. Uh, so like, let's say I get a contract, uh, a property under contract. Now I'm going to get in contact with my boots on the ground out in Houston. And I'm going to send her out to the property to take pictures so I can build a property profile so that I can then make it neat and pretty and then market it to buyers. So, and it'll, in there, we'll just include like a Google drive link with a, a folder of all the pictures that my, my boots on the ground out in Houston or rather property specialist, um, which is what I refer to as her as when I'm talking to the sellers, um, what she has taken pictures of and, and provided to me. So something like that, when I've a scheduled, Hey, you know, my, my property specialist is going to get out there, you know, how is Saturday at 3 PM? All right, cool. Then I can drop them into this lead scheduled appointment and it will, uh, send them a text saying, Hey, thanks. We're confirmed for this date. Uh, and then it'll send another text the day before saying, Hey, first name, just confirming our appointment for tomorrow at this time. If anything changes, please feel free to reach out. And then two hours before saying, Hey, first name, we'll be at the address in a few hours. If anything's changed, please let me know. If not, we'll see you then. So pretty powerful right there as well. Um, just all hands off, you know what I mean? And, uh, I'm sure it would prevent, I haven't gotten to that point yet through text, but I'm sure it will prevent a lot of, uh, cancellations rescheduled. And if they do cancel, then I have a whole other campaign for canceled appointment and it'll drip campaign automatically follow up with them saying, Hey, you know, we know life happens. Um, when's a, a better time that we can come out to the property. We're still interested. So those are like all the campaigns that I have right now. And the last one I have is a missed call campaign. So to kind of answer your question earlier, Frank, uh, they they will call back, um, and that is the goal. But what I have set up right now is called an IVR. Uh, what the hell is it? I just looked this up. Something uh, voice response, something interactive voice response. And what that is is you've you've seen this a lot too when you call the doctor, when you call the dentist, and you just get an automation uh, voice machine right right when you connect and it says thank you for calling this for the sales department press one for marketing press two that's an ivr or uh what's referred to as a call tree as well uh, a, a call tree like a plant and because it's like it can go off and branch off into different directions depending on what the person either types or says so right now uh as a way to filter all that out i have an ivr set up so when I drop them a voicemail and a lot of times people will call back thinking that, oh, I just missed this person's phone call and they left me a voicemail. Let me call them back. Nine times out of 10, they're going to call you back and say that they're not interested. Take me off the list. Stop texting me. So as a way to preserve my time and energy, I don't even answer the live calls when they come in. Rather, when they call back, it goes straight to the IVR, the call tree. It gives them two options. Thanks for calling. If you are interested in receiving an offer, press one and leave a message with your name, number, and property address. If you're not interested in receiving an offer, 
press two and that's it. Then every day I plan on, I haven't had anybody actually prompt uh, or click anything yet. Um, but maybe not every day, but frequently I can go in and then I can check how many people pressed one and are actually interested in receiving an offer. Then I can manually go to them, dial them and I have that conversation. Um, you know, I, it, it will decrease the amount of opportunities that I convert at scale, right? At scale, if I have a thousand people calling me back every day and, you know, five of them are actually interested and they call back and they press one, you know, by the time I call those five people back, I may actually only be able to get two of them on the phone. Uh, and then one of them has already talked with another investor. You know what I mean? Um, so at scale, it's you are sacrificing um, conversions by just sending them directly to an automated machine. But at this rate right now, um, I'm just trying to figure it all out. And it, it, to be honest, I didn't have that set up in the beginning and it was overwhelming because I was trying to respond to text, uh, categorize text, make sure everybody's in the proper campaign in the buckets. Meanwhile, I have somebody calling me back. I answer. They say, take me off your list. OK, hang up, you know, wasted my time. Um, so that's what I'm doing right now. And that's all the campaigns that I have in my text. That's what I'm excited about. I know this video is a cold calling camp, uh, video, but, uh, pretty excited about that. And yesterday I was kind of doing both at the same time, which is what I plan to do as well. But for now, what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to roll up. I'm going to hop on the dialer. I do live in California. It is legal just to put it out there because I know YouTube's. Actually, I, I correct myself. YouTube sell a cool for that reason. Um, I looked into the guidelines because I used to see people uh, just blowing gas down on certain videos. And I was like, what the hell? I didn't know that was possible. And then I looked into it. And yeah, if it's legal in your state and you're not promoting it or selling it, then it's all. Um, well, disclaimer, I'm not selling it. I'm not promoting it. Uh, it is. For my anxiety i gotta calm the nerves while i'm on the dialer you know what i mean so i gotta make sure that i have a little bit of something to assist me in that all right i might lose uh, audio for a second but then i'm gonna connect it right back check check, check. yeah okay, i think we're good let me know in the chat if anybody Check. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Let me know in the chat if anybody's in here listening, if you can hear me. I'm also curious to know if you can hear me more clear now that I have my headset on, because I don't know whether or not it's going through um, the, my input is going through my mic right here or my mic in my computer. I'm curious because it sounds super crispy in my, my headphones right now. Just curious if uh, that's what it sounds like through the, uh, the live feed as well. So I'm gonna hop in here and call tools, um, dashboard campaigns. This is my driving for dollars campaign. What that is for anybody who doesn't know, uh, there's different ways where you can generate lists, right? Step one in anything is going to be build a list, pull a list, get a list of properties that you are trying to get in contact with. That's goal number one, right? Now, what you can do is you can go pull a list from your county, you know, tax delinquent, hasn't paid taxes in the past two years, property taxes, uh, divorce lists. You can get in contact with divorce attorneys. You can, you know, there's so many different lists, but the only, maybe not the only, but to my knowledge right now, the only custom list that is custom to you is a driving for dollars list. And what that is, is simply driving down the street seeing a property that's in physical distress maybe they have a blue tarp on the roof they have overgrown grass they have mail that's bulging out of their mailbox that kind of a you know leads you to believe that the property may be vacant um broken down cars in the driveway uh, just anything you know what i mean any type of physical distress you would add it to your list and it's custom because the else is going to have this exact list as you because you are manually building this list yourself. Um, and a lot of times the properties that you're finding that may be in physical distress don't necessarily 
meet the criteria of any other list you may go be able to pull from the county. Um, you know, maybe they pay all their taxes. Maybe they haven't fallen behind on their mortgage payments. Maybe they aren't divorced. Maybe they aren't going into pre foreclosure. You know, maybe they just have an ugly house, uh, which doesn't mean much right now. But when they go to sell it, they're going to either it's, they're going to have two options. One, they're going to have to spend the money themselves to fix everything that needs to be fixed. Or two, they're going to need to sell it to a cash investor. Um, now, to go back to one, which is why they have to fix it, is because they will likely want to sell it to a retail end buyer, uh, a family, a first-time home buyer, uh, anybody like that, who is going to get a conventional loan. So if I were to go buy a house right now, I don't have the cash to pay it, pay for the house outright. So what I would do, I would go to, I would go to my bank. I would get pre-qualified for a loan and say, yeah, this is the house. Okay, boom, 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 boom. Let's buy the house with, you know, I'll put 20% down and then the bank will uh, fund 80, 80% of, uh, you know, the remainder. But what the bank is going to want is they're going to want inspections. They're going to want appraisals. They're going to want all types of stuff to go down their checklist to make sure that it's a sound investing, uh, investment for them. Because that's what it is at the end of the day. They're investing in Although it's not like a, they're expecting their returns automatically, it's a 30-year investment. And that's the duration of your, your mortgage. That, that's essentially what they're doing is they're betting on you that you're buying a, a good property that will likely appreciate in value that will, you know, that checks all the boxes. Now, if you have an appraisal or rather an inspection on a retail purchase and you go there and, and the bank sends out their inspector to the property and they have a hole in the roof, they have mold in the ceilings, they have termites in the floorboards, they're not going to give you that money. They're not going to loan on that property. So that's why somebody who has a physically distressed property has, again, two options. Spend the money, fix it up themselves so that it opens up their pool of buyers because now they can expose it to the retail market because it will pass inspections, because it will get a high appraisal rate, uh, or they need to sell it for a discount to a cash investor uh, quickly, right? I guess it doesn't have to be quick, but they have to sell it to a cash investor who's willing to take on those problems, but has to take all of that into consideration when making their price, which is why I say it's at a discount. Um, but yeah, I don't know how I got, oh yeah, that's the list I'm calling. So when you call a driving for dollars list, um, it's a lot more fun because a bunch of people aren't hitting this list. You'll call like a, a pre foreclosure list. You'll call a divorce list. And 90% of the people you connect with is stop fucking calling me. I'm getting so many damn calls. Take me off your list. But it's a uh, breath of fresh air when you call a driving for dollars list, because it's the complete opposite. 90% of these people haven't even gotten a phone call before. I'm the first time, I'm the first person that's even called and asked about the property. So it's really refreshing to call people like that. It makes the dialing session smooth and um, it allows me to call for longer because there's you got to play with the mental endurance game as well. When you hop on the, the phone with people or, or on a list that you're just getting a bunch of hate, you're getting a bunch of no's, a bunch of FU's, it's pretty discouraging. I'm not going to lie. It's like the last thing I want to do is stay on the dialer and continue talking with these people. But when you connect with people who are, it's, it's like, all right, well, I'm cool with that. If they're going to tell me no thank you, I'll get 99 no thank you before I get a real solid yes. I'm cool with that. You know I mean, so I'm going to hop in right now and join this Drive for Dollars campaign. Uh, here we go. You're not going to be able to hear what they're saying. Um, you can probably get a g the gist of it uh, just based off of what I am telling them. Uh, pretty cool little feature on this headset. I, I think it's really cool is you lift, you lift the like the toggled mic here and it automatically mutes it. So it's muted right now. So even if somebody did answer, they couldn't hear me. And then the second I drop it, it's unmuted. I thought that was like super cool when I was looking to buy this. Um, but yeah, I'm going to go through right now and try to get some people on the phone, get a little, hopefully gauge some people's interests and what they're doing pull my script out here um it's nothing too uh crazy on the script very simple actually um the intro this first page 
Hey, Connie. Connie, how's it going? This is Derek. Um, sorry, I, I know this is a, a bit random, but I was calling about a property I believe you own on Avenue M. Yeah, I just wanted to give you a quick call and wanted to see if you'd ever consider an offer on your property there. You ever consider selling? Sure, sure. I'll give you a ring then. All right, bye now. Uh, she seemed open to it. First contact of the day. She said, can you give me a call back around 6 p.m. tonight? Uh, which is really like an hour from right now, their time. So I'm going to write that down so I don't forget it. Connie Hammond, call back at 3 PST. Oh, no, that's 4 tripping for PST. I'm going to be out by then. I'll give her a call back tomorrow. Uh, so now I'm in post call. I'm going to add the contact disposition as follow up. Uh, I don't consider that as a lead until I get really down to the nitty gritty. I'm going to create a note, ask for a call back later today. I'm going to set a calendar event for me to actually just call her tomorrow. Um, I'm going to be out by the time she wants me to call back. So follow up. I'm going to leave the note for myself in the description of the event to say um, she asked or, or I'm going to say, yeah, let's say mention that uh, you got tied up at the end of the day yesterday as she wanted a call back in the uh, type call back event start. Tomorrow, I'll just do it tomorrow. It's closer to the morning. Save that. Mark the the call disposition as contact made. So anybody who's not familiar with the dialer, um, what I'm doing right now is is the disposition is essentially just telling the system what happened there. Um, so I mark it as a contact. I, I, I got a hold of the person who I am, I was wanting to get a hold of. Uh, that was Connie. I addressed her by name and she says yes. Uh, I asked her if she wanted a property. She asked for a call back. She had some consideration in her voice. So I'm going to mark her as a follow-up, not a warm, a hot lead, or not uh, not interested or do not uh, contact. I'm going to mark her as a follow-up. Leave myself a little note that gets attached to this property. Put a calendar event in, which is essentially like a to-do. And then uh, go ahead and submit all of that. Once I submit it, then it goes on and it starts dialing. Hello? Hey, is this Mr. Jones? Oh, I'm sorry about that. You as well. Um, that was trippy. It connected right away. Um, wrong number, though. So for this one, I'll mark it. Wrong number. Submit. And then it'll just start dialing on to the next. Uh, he might have even been like waiting on the other line. That was trippy. It was literally right when I clicked submit. Um, but yeah, you can tell just the power in that. It's just automatically, I don't have to do anything. I just sit back and wait for somebody to answer the phone. And then when they do, hop back in, have that conversation, start to try to pre-qualify. Uh, that was a pretty, pretty, I mean, it wasn't, the conversation didn't develop at all. But the fact that she didn't uh, say no and she asked for a call back, you could tell she's considered, she wants to hear more. So that was a good one. It was a good one for the first contact of the day. That's for damn sure. It's a nice little warm up. A lot of times I won't even be able to get through what I got through there. Um, and I, and I, and I frame my script, like see right there. And I got connected to a machine. So I hung up real quick and I just added another little call disposition as voicemail machine so that I can start tracking that. Uh, how many times it's actually patching me through to the voicemail so that I can determine whether or not I want to actually go uh, fast connection, normal or slow, like I was explaining earlier. But uh, I don't remember what I was just fucking saying. Oh, a lot of times. So I frame my script like that to allow the person on the other end of the phone to intervene. So same thing, voicemail. Um, I frame it that way. I say, this guy's name was Curtis. Hey, Curtis. And I ask it with an upward inflection to kind of ask a question. Hey, Curtis. 
it's almost like I know your name. I'm calling you by your first name. I just want to make sure that I dialed the right number, right? It's like a lot can be said in just your tone of voice, tonality. So, hey, Curtis, what I'm looking for is for them to say yes, to give me that confirmation that yes, this is the person you're asking for. And then I say, hey, Curtis, how's it going? This is Derek. And I say it that way to breed familiarity, say it in a way where it's like, you know me, it's Derek. You know what I mean? Hey, Curtis, it's Derek. As funny as it sounds, that's exactly what the, the point of that is. Hey, Curtis, how's it going? It's Derek. Um, and then I'll go straight to it. I don't allow them time to interrupt right there. I say, hey, Curtis, how's it going? It's Hey, hey is this Miss Gonzalez? Um, right there, she hung up on me, but I think I just got to the line a little too late. She hung up rather quick when I asked for Miss Gonzalez. So I'm going to mark it as not no contact, not wrong number. Um, so that I can try her again in the future. But, uh, after I say, Hey, Curtis, how's it going? This is Derek. Um, sorry. I, I know this is a bit random, but I was uh, calling about a, a property. And at that point, then they know, right? When I say the word property, they should know. Um, but again, a lot of these people aren't getting calls. Uh, so they don't know. Maybe they think that I'm some type of service company who is getting ready to come by and fix the plumbing or whatever the case is. It's like, Hey, uh, yeah, just give me a quick call about a property I believe you own on this street. And a few things there. You want to say believe the way that I said it in that tonality because you don't want to come across as knowing too much about them because that's kind of invasive, intrusive. And then it, it kind of sparks a thought in their head like, who is this and why does he know so much about me? He knows my name. He knows my exact address. So you don't say the number. You only say the street name. Hey, Curtis, yeah, just wanted to give you a quick call. And or sorry, hey, Curtis, how's it going? This is Derek. I just, uh, sorry, I know this is a, a bit random, but I was calling about a property I believe they own on Main Street. And again, with that upward inflection, kind of like you're asking a question, which will. Hello? Yeah, I'm getting a lot of voicemails here. And it allowed them to kind of answer. Hey, I'm, I'm calling about a property I believe you own on Main Street. Yes. What about it? That's like the most common response that I get. Yeah. What about it? Yeah. I just wanted to give you a quick call and uh, wanted to see if you'd ever consider an offer on your property there. You ever considered selling? And they'll, they, there is a, this is, again, this is all for that first page on my script. Uh, that it's my intro and the six or seven possible responses that they're going to tell you. And there's no more, no more than seven responses that they're going to say after you ask if they would receive, if they would consider an offer on their property. It's going to be yes, no, how much? Yes, maybe in the future. No, not right now. Hi, Ms. Vargas. Hi, how's it going? This is Derek. Um, sorry, I know this is a bit random, but I was uh, calling about a property I believe you own on Wellington Street. Yeah, I just wanted to give you a quick call and wanted to see if you'd ever consider an offer on your property there. You ever considered selling? Okay. Okay, so you got, you guys are kind of doing all the renovations yourself and it sounds like you probably plan to sell it on the market when it comes time. Okay, all right. Yeah, just to kind of let you know, myself, uh, you know, my partner, myself, we do have some cash on hand. We're looking to, to pick up a few properties and, uh, you know, we're typically looking for properties that, that we can build some equity into by doing the repairs ourselves. So, you know, if, if selling it in its as is condition, you know, before you make those repairs is something that you may be interested in, I'd, I'd love to get you an offer. Do you think that's something that, you know, you and your husband might consider? Right, right. Well, I'd love to, to learn a little bit about the property. Did you have a few minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. I'm going to step out of the office uh, kind of soon here. Is there a more appropriate time for me to follow up maybe early next week?
sure, I'll give you a ring. And, and yeah, I'd love to just learn a bit about the property, hopefully get you an offer to, uh, you know, have you and your husband consider. And, you know, e even if it's not a good fit, um, I, I wanted to ask, did you have like a realtor in mind that you were planning on listing on the market with after all those repairs were done? Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Sure. Okay. All right. Perfect. So I'll, I'll round back with you uh, Monday so that we can chat and uh, hopefully be able to lay out your options for you uh, and see if there's any way that I may be able to help. All right. What was your name again? Your first name? Carmen. Okay. My name is Derek again. If anything comes up in the meantime, feel free to, to reach back out. All right. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye now. Quality, quality conversation um, with her. What that story was, couldn't hear, but she said that um, they had considered selling. Her and her husband are currently doing renovations. They are getting ready to put a new roof on. Um, so that's when I confirmed. I was saying, oh, you guys are just going to do the repairs yourself and then list it on market. They said, yes. Then I kind of you know, threw a little bit of benefits in there. Well, we do have cash and, you know, um, but I wanted to kind of disqualify myself and say, you know, we are typically looking for places that we can do the repairs to um, so that we can build the equity into it ourselves uh, is selling it in its as is condition, something that you and your husband may be open to. And they said, then she said, well, it depends on what the offer is. I said, well, I'd love to learn a little bit about the property. Do you have a few minutes? And she said she was at the store. Um, but that I could call her back later today. Same thing as the other person. And I, that would, you know, luckily I had that conversation with the other person to know that I can't call you later today. I'm going to be out. Um, so I'm going to be out of the office so kind of soon here. Is there a more appropriate time for me to follow up next week? She said, yeah, call me Monday morning. I'll be with my husband at home. And we can talk about it. So boom. Um, it's really anybody who's watching this, who's considering getting into the business. It's that simple. You know, it really is call enough people. Have enough conversations like that follow up with those type of people enough you will get deals it's it's inevitable it's pretty crazy when you really look at it on a granular if that's a word uh you know level i guess that's the opposite of what i'm trying to say when you look at it on, on a big scale the bigger picture the big funnel you, you drop a thousand people to the top um you know you have a 15 percent contact rate that, which means I'm going to get a hold of 150 people uh, that I'm trying to get a hold of. I, I found that about every 40 to 50 people are very, 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 very strong leads. So out of 150 people that I connect with, I'd say I get like three really hot leads, meaning that the condition is poor. They don't have the financial means to make the repairs. They want to sell within the next 30 to 60 days. They have motivation as to why they want to sell it, and they are reasonable on price. I find that about every 50 people is somebody like that. Um, but about every 15 to 20 people is somebody like these people who are like, yeah, follow up with me. You know, I'll, I'll listen to an offer. Um, so talk with enough people. And then uh, I really haven't done enough deals to determine what my lead to contract ratio is. Um, but it's a little goal that I've set for myself is I want to make sure that I have at least um, 10 leads. You know, that's like my goal is get get 10 of those really, really hot leads. And one of those, you know, is bound to, to turn into a contract. And then industry standard, uh, or what I've gathered at least is about 50% contract to close, meaning that about half of the contracts that you get don't, don't actually end up closing because of title issues, tenant issues, um, Either the seller backs out or you back out because of you know unforeseen costs. Uh, so about fifty percent contract to close, which is something that I've have found. I mean, granted, my first three deals fell through probably due to my inexperience, but right now I've closed two of the five contracts that I got. So if I close, if I go one for one on the next contract that I get, I'll be sitting exactly at fifty percent contract to close. So uh, contact disposition, follow up, note. Uh, her and husband are doing repairs themselves. Um, open to hearing a cash offer uh, in as is condition if the price is right. Um, 
didn't have a realtor that they wanted to work with. This is something that I didn't mention. Uh, she mentioned that they would try to list it FSBO for sale by owner. So uh, it kind of speaks to their their situation as well. Is like they're wanting to do the repairs, but they're also not willing to hand it over to a realtor because they want all the money. They don't want to pay somebody else to find a buyer. They want to just put it on Facebook, Craigslist, drop a for sale by owner sign in the lawn in hopes that somebody's going to come along and give them exactly what they want, which is probably not going to be the case, which is why for sale by owner properties are great wholesale opportunities. You go to them, you essentially don't convince them, but you open their eyes to the fact that you can't just drop a sign in your lawn and think that somebody's going to come and pay for your house at the price that you want, you know? So that's why they're such good um, opportunities. So I'll put a calendar event, Monday, follow up, um, pre-qualify, dive a little deeper into the condition, maybe their situation. That's the hardest part, right? Is figuring out why they want to sell without just boldly asking them, hey, why do you want to sell this place? You know what I mean? Um, so you got to build a little rapport before you just start asking that type of question. Contact me. Perfect example, though. I was able to kind of get through the, a good chunk of the script there. And the reason I asked for Miss Vargas right there is because the name that popped up is Alexander Vargas. So I, I knew that... Oh, I need to, I knew that uh, it was obviously not Alexander. So I asked for miss the last name. Hopefully that makes sense. This is like real purple, like grapes. Shout out to all of everybody on the bay that knows about them grapes. We were smoking grapes out there and it was great. I'll give a hundred dollars to anybody who tells me what song that is. We were smoking grapes out there and it was great. I'll give somebody a thousand bucks if they can tell me what song that's from. I'd be so impressed. I'll come on here in like a week and put what song that is in the comments. Leave everybody some time to try to guess. <laughs> I'm smoking grapes out there. It was great. OG Kush, Silver Kush, Master Kush, Super Silver. Super Silver. Grapes. Thank <laughs> you. 
Hello, is this Alex? Oh, I'm so sorry. Wrong number. You see, like, that was a perfect example. By the time I got on the line, it was very clear to me that she had already been there. Because the first thing that I heard was, hello, which to me shows that she, that wasn't the first time she said hello. That makes sense. She was pissed. See, it just happened again. Right when I connected, they hung up. Um, yeah. Could be a lot of things. Um, one is I'm through Bluetooth, uh, not direct USB cord to my computer. I don't think that has anything to do with how quickly it's connecting to the line, but what is, is the fact that I'm on Wi-Fi. Um, it is recommended with these type of predictive dollars to be hardwired through the ethernet. Um, I don't know, maybe one day I'll try to do that. It's, I'm not gonna be able to do that with my laptop. I don't think I have that, um, the ethernet port, I don't. So it's like 2021, you know what I mean? What's going on? Why isn't Wi-Fi enough? Why well, I have to connect to the ethernet? This is crazy talk. But I, I'm, I'm almost certain that that would fix the issue that I keep talking about, this whole delayed connection. Um, Hey, Florence. Hi, there, this is Derek. Um, sorry, I know this is a bit random, but I was calling about a property I believe you own on Soren Lane. I hate when people do that. Uh, she hung up only after I asked about the property. I hate when people do that, not because I'm like emotional, although I sure am, but uh, I hate it because I. I don't know. I don't know if I should call them back at one point in time. I don't know if I should mark that as a contact and mark it not interested. Uh, she also didn't really confirm with me the way that she responded to me saying her name. I said, hey, Florence. She said, how can I help you? It almost sounded like she was a receptionist and I might have gotten the wrong number or something. So in this case, I think I'm going to mark it as wrong number. Um, that way it deletes that number. I never call that number again, but I will try the other numbers associated with that address. Again, that's why I don't like it. It's just, it makes my job more difficult, but whatever, I guess.
You know what I mean? Like, ideally, I want them to say, yes, this is the person that you're looking for. No, I'm not interested. Even if they say it rudely, I don't care. I just need to know. I, I got to know. I got to know. Quit playing with my mind. What's that line? The scene, uh, remember the Titans. When sunshine started fucking around with, uh, whatever, uh, dude's name was. Uh, he's in the locker room, like, hey, man, you know, not like I care or anything, but, you know, you know, like, he's asking if he's gay. He's, you know, are you, is it, is it true? Or, you know, it's, a, it's not true, right? He's like, so he's like, not like it matters, but, you know, I just, you know, is it true? And he's like, he says, if it doesn't matter, why do you need to know? He says, I, I, I just need to know. <laughs> I got to know. He's like, he says something else and he doesn't answer his question. He's like, well, if you don't need to know, or if you need to know, if it doesn't matter, why do you need to know? He's like, and I just need to know, quit playing with my mind. <laughs> That always had me cracking up. This shit's so funny to me. If you don't need, if it doesn't matter, why do you need to know? So I gotta know, man. Sheesh. Try to get one more contact here um, before I hop off. It was going to be a quick session today anyways. Um, yeah, it's definitely slower than yesterday. Uh, I think a few different things. One, it's Friday. Uh, two, the time of day. It's kind of like right before everybody's getting off work or maybe just got out of school, picking up kids from school. This time is like, I find that it's a little bit slower, like three to five. Uh, whereas like one to three is really good. Hey, Mr. Perez. How's it going? This is Derek. Uh, sorry, I know this is a bit random, but I was... Uh, calling about a property, I believe you own on West Street. Oh, okay, completely understand. Uh, well, I have you. Would you happen to have any others you might consider selling at the moment? No, okay. I appreciate you taking the call. Not for sale. Not interested. Market contacts. Um. Yeah, the time of day. The. Uh, uh, the list as well. I've already called through a lot of these people. So I've already. Uh... Hello. Hi, this is Miss Lopez. Hi there. This is Derek. Um, sorry, I know this is a bit random, but I was 
I'm talking about a property I believe you own on Soren Lane. Yeah, I just wanted to give you a quick call and wanted to see if you would ever consider an offer on your property there. You ever considered selling? No, okay. Completely understand. You think uh, in the near future at all or no? Okay. All right. Well, if it's more pro or appropriate for me to maybe follow up in like six months, would that be okay with you just to kind of check in and see how things are? No. Okay. Okay. Well, I appreciate you taking the call anyways. Bye now. Um, I will always kind of do that, like invite them to give me permission to follow up just in case something changes, something comes up. You know, it's good to have contingency plans, backups. But in her case, I do that for them to either give me permission or shut me down. If they're going to shut me down like she just did, then I know not to waste my time. But if they're going to give me permission, it's like they've probably thought about selling before. They just don't want to deal with it right now. Um, they know that maybe their circumstances are going to change in the near future and know that they might have to sell the property within the next you know, year or two. So they will give me permission. But in her case, she was like, you know what? I mean, I, I really don't have any plan on selling anytime soon. So there's really no reason for you to follow up. Like, All right. Appreciate you taking the call. Anyways, it's if. To be honest, I, I'd love to hear that because, again, that's just going to save me time in the future. I don't have to unnecessarily follow up with her uh, just to get a no again. Um, you know, she's like, yeah, I mean, to be honest, like I wouldn't follow up. There, I really have no intention on selling. All right. Cool. Cool with me. Oh. Hey, Jose. Jose? Jose, how's it going? This is Derek. Um, sorry, I know it's a bit random, but I was calling about a property I believe you own on, on Meadow Lake. That was uh, frustrating. Meadow Lake is too long. Meadow Lake Road. Uh, he hung up anyways right when I said uh, Meadow Lake. That was Jose. I don't know. You know, sometimes you get Jose's that aren't the same Jose or the Joe's that aren't the Joe's or the Chris's that aren't the Chris's. And, and for some reason, they're all the number gets attached to the property just because they share a first name. I have that very often uh, where they're like, well, I am Jose, but I'm not, uh, you're looking for Jose who? And I say, Jose Garcia. And he's like, Oh no, I'm Jose Hernandez. Uh, you know, and I was like, Oh, do you know the owner of the prop, the uh, owner of the property at this address? It's like, I have no idea, man. I live in Florida. You know what I mean? And it's like, Oh, you know, so, in that case, he did respond to Jose. I'm going to see if there's any other phone numbers associated. There isn't. So that's a perfect example. On this property, there is only one phone number. So I'm going to assume that that was the Jose I was looking for. Markham is not interested because he hung up on my ass. And Markham has a contact. I said I was only going to do... I said I was only going to do one, but... I've already had like three contacts since then. It's pretty addicting, man. For anybody, I'm, I'm hoping that this, if anything, motivates somebody who is thinking about hopping on the phones, maybe reluctant, has a little bit of fear. That was me. It still is. I'm not going to lie. That's not like I, I look forward to getting on the phone. But nowadays, I kind of do. Uh, with this new software and this new implementation of marketing strategies with texting and Again, this new dialer, it's pretty like addicting to be able to get a hold of so many people so quickly and to determine whether or not if it's worth your time. It's like, I really do enjoy it now. Um, once you figure out how to act on the phone, uh, you, you start to find that people treat you with more respect. Right. Um, hello? Hello? Hi there. Uh, this is Derek. I um, don't know if I have the right number here. I'm hoping that you could help. Uh, I was looking for the owner of a property on Exeter Street. Oh, okay, I might have the wrong information here. I was looking to get a hold of that owner there to see if there was any interest in possibly selling the property. Would you happen to know the owner?
Okay, okay. I appreciate that. I, thank you so much for taking the call. Hung up on me. Uh, I think that that was the person I was trying to get a hold of. This happens quite often too. Um, I framed it that way because this property is in a trust. So it doesn't give me a first or last name. It just gives me the Lincoln Trust Company, um, which is, it's probably a family trust, last name Lincoln. They put all their properties in a trust. Um, this person answered. So I, that's why I framed the beginning the way that I did, because I couldn't just ask for the Lincoln Trust Company. So I said, hey, I'm not sure if I have the right number here, hoping that you can help out, help me out. I was looking for the owner of a property on Exeter Street. And then she was like, I'm not sure what you're referring to, really reluctant. And I was like, yeah, I was just actually trying to get a hold of the, the owner of that property. And I'll always continue my script. Um, I always just assume that they're lying or assume that in this case, I did get a hold of the right person. This is the person who I'm wanting to speak with. So I just continue with my script. Yeah, I was just looking to get a hold of that owner there. Um, and I frame it in a way where it's like, I know. I'm not talking to the owner, but it's like internally, I'm thinking to myself, I know that you're the owner, but I'll play your game, right? Yeah, I was just looking to get a hold of the owner of that property uh, to see if um, they would ever consider an offer on it. And she goes, um, uh, I was, and she, I don't think she said anything. I said, would you happen to, to know the owner? Or she says, she says, uh, possibly. Um, but I do know that the owner of that property is not interested in selling. <laughs> so it's like, what do you mean? What does that mean? First, you, first, you didn't know what I was talking about. Then you possibly knew the owner and now you are speaking on their behalf, letting me know that they're not interested. Okay. You're the owner. You could have just told me that again, in this case, there's only one phone number associated with the property. So I'm just going to assume that that was the owner market, not interested market as a contact people like that are so funny to me uh, I, it's understandable though i don't want to make it seem like all oh, these people are so dumb for not disclosing their information it's like i, I completely get it hey mario hey this is derek uh, sorry i no hey sorry i know this is a bit ra oh yeah, yeah i was looking for mario i'm sorry Oh, I'm sorry about that. All right, bye now. Uh, that's what, it was the wrong number. That's what'll happen if you, I don't get, uh, I don't get the response that I'm looking for when I address them by the first name. So I said, hey, Mario. And he said, hello. So I just continued with the script. And then he kind of cut me off. I'm sorry, were you looking for Mario? This is Nick. And I was like, yeah, I'm looking for Mario. Like, oh, you have the wrong number. I was like, oh, all right. Um, I'm going to kill it there. All right, myself not available. Submit it. Go not available. Hop over to campaigns. Exit the campaign. Boom. Been logged out. Um, excuse me. So that's that on the dialers. Let's see what type of numbers I put up up over the manager dashboard today i called 279 numbers 20 of them were human 57 of them were machine uh 16 of the 20 humans actually patched through to me which left four that were abandoned so 20 percent of the time somebody answered and i was not there to talk with them because i was on the other line um bunch of other stats seven busy eight failed yada yada um but that just goes to show you um two calendar events created um meaning that i spoke with two people that i set some type of follow-up for uh, i think that's like yeah i mean again 16 so i connected with 16 people of those 16 um of those this isn't the right report that i need to look at reports um campaign performance for today so 77 calls outbound that were connected is this just today huh. so 20 minutes i was available 13 minutes i was on post call 
six minutes of talk time while I was actually on the phone with people, which is a trip. I was probably on the dialing for like an hour, but I was really only on the phone with people for about six minutes. Uh, 206 calls were not connected. 20 calls to humans. Um, three of them I marked as no contact. Four of them I marked as wrong number. Um, six of them I marked as contact. So I made six contacts today. Uh, not very high at all, but it was a very quick session. Um, three of them were voicemails that patched through. Four of them abandoned. Again, so if I was able to perfect that system right there and connect with everybody, that makes a pretty big difference. That makes uh, make it, it, it's the difference between me connecting with six people today and me connecting with 10 people. Um, so there you have it. Uh, sorry that you can't hear what's going on in the headphones. Let me go ahead and turn these off. Make sure that my sound is the way that it's supposed to. That should be good. Um, anybody who tuned in, appreciate you. Um, I'm going to, my plan here is to get an external speaker that I can hook up to my computer, which will then allow me to hopefully this is my this is my plan here to use the speaker as the output and my headset as the input the reason i just don't want to not use my headset is because i spent good money on it and the sound quality is so much better on the other end so when they're talking to me they can hear the quality of my headset uh, so what i'm going to try to do is have the output come out of the speakers so that me and you guys can hear what they're saying out loud from the speaker. And then when I talk to them, it's coming through my, my mic. So that's something I'm looking into. Uh, I want to get that so that you guys can hear. It's It'll just be the best way for everybody to hear what is being said on the seller's end as well as mine and me not having to sacrifice the sound quality from my microphone. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do there. I have a few... Uh, video concepts that uh, the homie Jay Lep dropped for me last live session yesterday. He's uh, asked for me to go through some contracts, uh, some of the language within the contracts. So uh, I plan to do that, pre-record that and upload it um, as a pre-recorded video as opposed to a live session like this. Uh, I plan to give you an overview of the different type of contracts that I use in my business, uh, being the purchase and sale agreement that I use to go to direct to seller the assignment agreement that I uh, use to assign my interest in that purchase or sale agreement to an end cash buyer, um, an addendum, uh, cancellation agreement, uh, post possession agreement, which will allow somebody to stay in the property after it's sold for a certain period of time. And I can kind of explain how each are used. I'm going to try to limit it to contracts that I have only personally used, although I do. Uh, have knowledge and am familiar with other contracts. I don't necessarily want to speak to them uh, about them or try to claim that I know the ins and outs of them uh, when I haven't personally used them in my business. But uh, And then I'm going to take a deep dive probably in each contract as a separate video. Uh, first one being the purchase and sale agreement. I'll go through what I use, uh, the language in my purchase and sale agreement, dissect it like line item by line item. Um, as I would with the seller when I'm on the phone with them answering their questions. So I'm uh, going to do that. Maybe I'll, I, I don't think I have enough subscribers to host a premiere, but I, you know, in the future, I would love to drop a video like that and watch it with you guys so that I can address any of your questions while we're all watching it at the same time. I think that'd be really cool. But until then, if you uh, enjoy the content, I'd appreciate a thumbs up, quick like. Um, any questions that you may have had that popped up through the duration of the video, any comments that you want to share, um, please drop them in the comment section. I get notified anytime anybody drops a comment. So uh, I've been responding to all the comments that come through. Uh, if you have any future suggestions for me, recommendations on A, either how to um, you know better generate leads as I'm doing on the on the live sessions here, if you think that you have some tips, tips, tricks, or tactics that I could use or implement in my process, please feel free to share that if you would be so kind to do that. I'm an open book. I don't want to make it seem like I know exactly what I'm doing because I don't. Again, my name is Derek. I live in California. I virtually source wholesale opportunities in Texas, Houston to be exact. 
Um, I've done two deals. I've been doing this for about a year now. I've only been taking it really seriously for like the past six months. I've done two deals, meaning that I have gone under contract with the seller and assigned my interest to the, the end cash buyer. I'll be forthright. My first deal, I made 6000 which was split between me and my JV partner who was in Houston. Uh, if you want to kind of look into that deal and get more insight on that one, I, I do have a playlist on my page where I um, just kind of grouped all of my videos, all of my live sessions surrounding around that first deal. I believe the name of that playlist is my first wholesale deal. Uh, so you can kind of see that beginning to end and all of the, the troubles and the, uh, everything that I ran into, the obstacles that I had to overcome with the title company, the tenant, uh, all that good stuff. So that's all documented there. I did that intentionally so that a, a, a beginner can go there and really see an A to Z beginning to end on um, how it is that you get it under contract all the way to close.